Vector Calculus, Math with Vectors. In this short video, we'll just talk about doing math with vectors, simple things like addition, subtraction, cross products, dot products. But the real important thing that I want to cover and try to convey to you is the picture behind these. Because if you can develop a picture of what cross products means, what dot products means, then you're in a better position to understand electromagnetics. Let's talk about vector addition. Let's say we have two vectors, u and v, and we'd like to calculate a third vector, that is u plus v. Visually, we'll just draw one vector u and then draw the next vector starting from the tip of the first vector. The sum of those two is a vector extending from the beginning of the first vector to the end of the second vector. So they make a triangle, and the long side of that triangle is the vector sum. We can do a very similar thing for vector subtraction, and we'll draw that first vector again, u. The second vector, we will invert. And so now we're sort of back to addition again, just we've made one of those vectors negative, but we've drawn it from the tip of the first vector, and then we draw the second vector, and now the difference, or in this case, the sum of those two, but we've made one negative, is the vector that connects the tip of the first vector, sorry, the beginning of the first vector to the tip of the second vector. And that's a vector difference. Also makes a triangle. So in summary, really no matter what coordinate system you're in, you'll just look at the individual components of the vectors and add or subtract them. So that works for Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical. And so I've just dumped it all here to show you that it's all the same. Now we move on to the dot product. The dot product is all about projections, as you'll see. So I'm drawing on this slide our two vectors, A and B, in arbitrary directions, and there's some angle between them that we're labeling as theta. So the dot product, A dot B, a and B are both vectors, gives us a scalar quantity back. That scalar quantity is the product of the magnitude of those vectors, so the magnitude of both come into the answer of our dot product, times cosine of the angle. That means if the angle between them is zero degrees, they're parallel, the dot product will be its largest. If they're perpendicular to each other, that angle theta will be 90 degrees and the dot product is zero. So this first expression is sort of just how we think about the magnitude of the dot product and what comes into it. The second equation is how we calculate it in Cartesian coordinates. And notice we multiply the x components of a and b together. Then we multiply the y components together and the z components and we add all that up, and that gives us our dot product. But just looking at that, and in other coordinate systems, it, it looks a little bit weirder, but just looking at that, we don't really get physically what that means, whereas we do in the first equation. The magnitudes of both vectors go into what the dot product is and the cosine of the angle between them. So I said dot products is all about projections, and so we can use this to project one vector onto another. Let's think about projecting vector A onto vector B. So really what we're looking for is this vector, which is in the direction of B, and whose magnitude equal to the component of vector A, which is along B. So let's think through this. Now, of course, the equation is in the upper right, but let's think through it. Well, first, we need a unit vector in the direction of B. Because if we're looking at the component of A along B, then the magnitude of B should not affect our answer. So right away, we'll take B and divide by its magnitude. So we really just have a unit vector of B over here. Then if we take the dot product of that with A, what we end up with is just the magnitude of that vector, the component of A along B we still need to give it a direction. Well, the direction again is in the direction of B, 
So we'll reuse this unit vector we have, b divided by its magnitude. So now we have a magnitude and a direction, and we can lump all of this together into one single equation that calculates the projection of a along b. Similarly, we can project b onto a, but it's really the same equation. Since we're talking about the component of B in the direction of A, only the direction of A should matter. That's why we have vector A divided by its magnitude. That ratio is a unit vector in the direction of A. So when we take the dot product with B, that dot product then gives us the magnitude of the projection. We still need to multiply by the direction of that projection, which is in the direction of A. So A divided by the magnitude is that unit vector. And we lump all of this together and we get our final equation, which is the projection of B along A. And we can look at the equation on the previous slide and see that it's the same equation, just with A and B swapped. So the dot product has this cosine of the angle between them. And we mentioned then, if those angles are perpendicular, the dot product will go to zero because there is no component of one vector along the other one because they're perpendicular. So in fact, we can use this as a test to see if two vectors are perpendicular. We calculate their dot product and see if it's zero. And this is done so commonly that just dot product becomes the words for when two vectors are perpendicular. And I've heard people giving talks at conferences and just saying dot product is zero and they go on. And really what they meant to say is that they're perpendicular. So it's that common, it's used that much, it's, it is almost a verb now. So that's called the dot product test. Now on to the cross product. This is yet another way to multiply two vectors. Unlike the dot product that gave us a scalar answer, the cross product gives us a vector answer. Let's think about what this means. So on this slide, you see vectors A and B, and any two vectors form a parallelogram. Well, it turns out the magnitude of that cross product is the area of that parallelogram. That's rather interesting. So if we're ever given some strange triangle or parallelogram off in some weird orientation and we need to calculate the area, the cross product is a very convenient way to do that. Well, that area is just the magnitude of the cross product. We need to know its direction. Well, the direction, it turns out, will be per exactly perpendicular to the plane defined by A and B. And so, the way we interpret the cross product is this equation that we're showing over on the right. Again, the magnitudes of both A and B come into the cross product, but now instead of having cosine of the angle between them, it's the sine of the angle. This means we will have a maximum when the two, ve two vectors are perpendicular to each other. When they're parallel to each other, we will have no cross product, it'll be zero. And well, why is that? Well, remember the direction of the cross product is perpendicular to the plane formed between A and B. So if A and B are in the same direction, we can't define a plane. And so that really only makes sense to make the cross product zero at that point. So the AB sine theta is the magnitude of the cross product. And of course the direction, I'm writing a unit vector here that is perpendicular to the plane defined by A and B. So that's the cross product. And remember again, the dot product gave us a scalar answer. The cross product gives us a vector answer. And that vector direction is perpendicular to the plane defined by A and B. So here's how we can calculate the cross product. Let's calculate A cross B and let's express A and B in Cartesian coordinates. The first thing we'll do is construct an augmented matrix. So in the top row of the matrix, we have our unit vectors X, Y, and Z. In the second row, we'll have our components of A, and then in the third row, we'll have our components of B. Then what we'll do 
is we'll take these first two columns of our matrix and copy them over to the right hand side. That's just for convenience and you'll see why in a few minutes. Well, less than a few minutes. Let's look at it now. So here's our augmented matrix. What we do now is multiply all of the diagonals. So for example, I'll take this first diagonal. This will be in the direction of X and it will be AY times BY. So there we are, AY times BY in the direction of X. Our second diagonal will be in the direction of Y and it's AZ times BZ, sorry, AZ times BX. So AZ times BX in the Y direction. And then the third diagonal will be in the Z direction, AX times BY. So AX times BY in the Z direction. Then we do it for the diagonals in the other direction. So we will have AY times BX in the Z direction. Then AZ times BY in the X direction and then BZ times AX in the Y direction. And that's why we wrote these other two columns over here. It just makes identifying those diagonals a lot easier. So we've multiplied all of our diagonals at this point. The diagonals that extended from the upper right to the lower left, we will make all of those negative. Then the last thing we do is we add everything up. And we have our final equation for the cross product of two vectors. This is not as clean and pretty as the dot product equation, but cross products come up all the time and they're very important. So we said the dot product goes to zero when the vectors are perpendicular. And so we use that as a test to see when two vectors are perpendicular. Well, likewise, the cross product goes to zero when two vectors are parallel. So we can use this as a test to see if the two vectors are parallel. These products follow simple rules. We have the commutative laws. And for the dot product, we're allowed to swap the order. For the cross product, we're allowed to swap the order. But when we do that, we change the sign. And that's simply because the vector is pointing the other way perpendicular to that surface defined by A and B. There's a handedness associated with cross products. The associative laws, we only have that for cross products, but if we have A cross B cross C, we are allowed to calculate A cross B and then do the cross product with C, or we can calculate the cross product of B and C and then do the cross product with A. So we're free to change the order of that. We have our distributive laws. So if we take the dot product of the sum of two vectors, well, it's the sum of the dot products, pretty much like standard algebra. And the same thing for the cross product. If we have the cross product of the sum of two vectors, we have the sum of the two cross products. So these make it easier to manipulate vector equations algebraically. We also have the self product. If a vector is dot producted with itself, if that's a word it is now, that's the magnitude of the vector squared. And then if we have the cross product of a vector with itself, that is zero. That has to be zero because a vector is certainly parallel to itself. And we also have triple products, two types. There's a vector and a scalar triple product here we're showing the scalar triple product. And why is that a scalar triple product? Well, uh, let's take A cross B. The cross product gives us a vector, but then the last calculation is the dot product, which gives us a scalar. Well, it turns out that scalar triple product is the volume of the parallel pipette we're showing to the right. So vectors A, B, and C define some volume called a parallel pipe head. If we look at A cross B, remember the magnitude of that is the area of this parallelogram that I'm outlining with the cursor. So A cross B is the area of that parallelogram. Well, the volume of that 
parallel pipe bed is the area times the height. The height is not exactly along C. The height is in that direction perpendicular to the top and bottom face, which is actually the magnitude of C times the cosine of the angle between that vertical axis and the C vector. So A cross B dot C gives us the volume of that parallel pipe. That is incredibly useful. Then we have the vector triple product. And this is a vector triple product because the cross product of B and C is a vector. And then yet the other or the final cross product gives us another vector. Interestingly, we can write that as the difference of two dot products. And then once we do the dot product, that becomes a scalar which makes sense to multiply a scalar times a vector. That just changes the magnitude of the vector. So this comes up when we derive the wave equation.